Hello, welcome to Cerulean Arts Gallery. Uh, tonight we are speaking with R.A. Friedman, Barbara Mimna, and Claire Owen in conjunction with their three-person exhibition, Once Upon a Time. So the three artists offer a contemporary take on narrative art as sometimes humorous, lyrical, and perplexing. So welcome R.A. Claire and Barbara. Good to see you. Thank you, Michael. Good to see you too. Yeah. So we're going to, I'll spotlight Tina's uh, camera. And who would like to speak first about themselves and their work? Any volunteers? Well, our AIC, you right next to me in the. the okay, no one, no, one ever, <laughs> so, <laughs> no one ever wants. No one else ever wants to go first. Um, so my name is R.A. Friedman. I use my initials because I actually worked for many years and continue to work with a, a gentleman who has the same uh, first name as me. He's also Robert Friedman, although he spells his last name slightly differently. So um, I'm a visual artist in Philadelphia and I work with photography and also drawing and these pieces were done with a pinhole camera, which essentially is a light sensitive uh, plane or film. Uh, in this case, it was instant film and it, a tiny aperture uh, that fills in as a, as a lens. And the series that's in the show was done on uh, instant film, peel apart black and white instant film that's no longer being made. Um, in many, many sessions with many, many fantastic models who were, who really uh, became collaborators, uh, creative collaborators on the project. And I could never have done it without them. So uh, a shout out a shout out to them, uh, too many to name <laughs> right at the moment and for me to remember <laughs> uh, their names, but you know who you are. Um, uh, photographing them in my studio over many, many sessions using a light that I actually uh, would move around and paint with light in the studio using very, very long exposures that would run for anywhere from three to sometimes seven or eight minutes. And that material that kind of looks like a sort of ectoplasm, that's actually me moving around the space with a light. So it's the trace and I kind of vaporize into nowhere. I then would take these individual shots. These are some of the original Polaroids here um, and then map them together in Photoshop, uh, creating compositions. Uh, I wouldn't exactly call them narratives, um, they were sort of more just arrangements of figures that sometimes had kind of an evocative feeling. Um, and it was a very slow and labor intensive in pro process uh, working on these. Took about eight years to make about nine images. Um, it was very slow and I'm very fussy. So, but uh, this is the result. And this is uh, one of the first times it's the first time in Philadelphia that the final series is being shown. This is about mm -hmm. half of the uh, images are in the show that's now up at Cerulean Arts. Thank you, Ari. Thanks. Thanks. Claire, we'll um, okay. ask you to speak a bit about yourself and your work. Sure, sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, I was delighted to be invited to the show. Um, and I'm really delighted with my fellow exhibitors as well. I think there's a wonderful resonance between our, our work, um, different media, different approaches, but the idea of uh, being inspired by fairy tales and uh, the idea of uh, stories that have existed um, in cultures that originally were written for everybody, not just for children, um, folk tales. And then as that literature evolved and became specifically children's literature, it changed. Um, those early tales um, are darker than we would think of for children for the reason that they were meant um, as cautionary tales, certainly, 
Um, don't go into the woods at night, you know. Um, and and also they were morally laden with how to behave yourself, you know, how to be a good boy or girl. This piece, The Thing in the Forest, is from was inspired directly by a short story by A.S. Byatt, an English writer, um, who wrote about two young girls who, who got lost in the forest together during the evacuation of children from London during the Blitz. They, they took children out of London during the Second World War um, and to, to save them because, you know, London was being bombed to smithereens and um, they got lost and they found, they encountered this thing and it's described hideously. She's a marvelous writer. Um, and they, I think she was writing about fascism. That's really what this beast was, you know, that the girls encountered. It was pretty clear that that's what it was. And they came out of it, they went home, and then they, they met again later on. So it was really, but it's just um, a story that, you know, had a big impact. I remember it very vividly. And I wanted to, you know, illustrate it, basically. I'm not... I'm not uh, ashamed of saying I illustrate stories because I do. And I think that's a fine way to describe a lot of what I do. Um, and the illustrative techniques of bright colors and details. Um, I loved books as a kid and I would just fall into the illustrations. So um, I enjoy, enjoy being able to make those. This is um, a bedtime story, a little girl going to bed with her teddy bear, followed by following the uh, big bad wolf himself. Um, and this, it's, you know, she's not afraid. Um, she's not a victim. Um, what happens when they, when they get up the stairs? We don't know. Um, is he a threat? He looks a little threatening. Um, I, I kind of want all those things to just be something that could happen and let the viewer determine, you know, how scary it's going to get. Um, I've had um, someone at a, an exhibit I had saw a picture like this and she had her grandchild and she says, oh, grandma, that's so scary. Those pictures are so scary. And she says, all right, we won't go there. She says, oh no, would you bring me back in so I can look at them again? <laughs> and, it, and it really reinforced what I've always thought about kids kind of like, they like being scared, you know, and they like that frisson of fear, you know, um, so it was it was fun to to have that reaffirmed, you know, when I um, by that story. So, um, sure, illustrated books, my uh, illustrated manuscripts from medieval times, which are just incredible. The the amount of detail, and again, the bright um, kind of high uh, chroma, high highly pigmented illustrations, uh, always just appeal to me. You know, they just. And you're working on oil on panel. I am oil on panel. Um, I just, I've just always liked the smoother surface. The toothiness of, of, of a canvas didn't appeal to me as much. So I like the, the, the smoothness that the, the panels give me. So, yeah. Great. Well, thank you, Claire. Yeah, sure. Tell us a bit about yourself and your work in this show. Okay, so this one is, uh, oh, this one is uh, Adam Returns, yes. So I kind of uh, had some fun with, with this one. Um, I was, um, it's, it's really, I, I wrote a few notes here, so maybe I'll just refer to them in front of you. This painting uh, is really meant to be a choice between good and evil. And to tell you the truth, I really had in mind a kind of uh, a situation that's going on in our country now that, that has um, disturbed me, many of us. And uh, this seemed a time to bring Adam back in the, into the picture. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's here to make his choice between good and evil. And he's right at it again with his apples, disobeying <laughs> God's command that he's not allowed to eat the apple. Uh, Eve is nowhere in sight, so it's all up to him right now. And uh, 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 so he's unleashing this evil uh, upon the peaceful landscape that is spread before him and all its inhabitants. 
And so you can read it for yourself. We've got a wolf in there who's ready to howl and do trouble. We've got our uh, Mary and Joseph on, with a donkey. She's on her way to uh, have a baby and maybe uh, we can think about what happens to that baby eventually is another terrible evil in the world. And, uh, and, I th and we've got a man going about his business, not paying attention to anything, you know, he's, he's got his life. And way in the background, we keep going way back, way back. And uh, we've got a little bit of modern, modern city here, uh, the, the high rises. And uh, to the right, my right anyway, we've got, uh, I think there's a modern man here, sort of trying to figure out what's going on. He's in for it too. And, uh, and all the way out to the sea. So I've tried to get every, the whole world in here. And, uh, okay. and that's about it. We'll finish with that one. So Barbara, these are oil on canvas? Um, the one we just saw Adam returns is um, actually a, acrylic, which I've just uh, started to use recently. I've always been an oil, oil painter, but I found some new uh, good, good acrylics that are just please me so much. I think I've been waiting for them all, all my life. So, so this one is uh, called Lost Child. And that is, a, that one is actually done in oil. And um, so I, I just sort of reads from my notes here that this child by circumstance or by the way society chooses to see her or as she sees herself is subject to an uncertain identity. And here she's shown between two cultures, a dominant, the one on the right, you could say that's a dominant culture and the ethnic culture on the other side. Maybe she's adopted, who knows, the, the viewer can decide. But it just, she just might as well be between gay and straight, black and white, or whatever the viewer imagines may isolate a child. And maybe I'm even thinking of my own background, uh, which is a, a divide between uh, uh, you, you, Russian, Ukrainian, and Italian. So I sort of know this feeling myself. I guess I was projecting it into this painting. So that's all I have to say on that one. Uh, oh, did we toward home? Oh yes, well, this is a little more pleasant painting maybe <laughs> than, than some of the others. Uh, it's a tale of the pleasure of uh, returning home. And here I, I just wanted to say something that I'm interested in, which is a, a, a mix of races in the family, the black and white. And I was trying to really incorporate this in not only this painting, but in other paintings to make it, make it not a political statement, but just as a natural way of being, mixed race in families which is in my own family and many others. And, and so uh, I think this just shows uh, that and maybe the, the uh, woman on the, on the little donkey, she's kind of weighing him down, I guess. She's so tall in there. And maybe she's having a little conversation with the uh, fellow in front of her. Maybe it's her husband, maybe it's a servant, who knows? And uh, the sort of boy on the back there, he's, uh, He's a joyous, joyous figure, happy to be on his way. And where they've come from, you can decide for yourself. I don't really know. And that's about it on that one. I, I really expect the viewer to put in uh, mm -hmm. ideas for him or herself mm -hmm. on all of these paintings, because I'm never quite certain uh, what, what, the, what the full meaning is about any of them. Mm -hmm.
Yes, now we're going to zero in on the satyrs and nymphs, which is <laughs> my favorite one here. I had a lot of fun with this painting. And uh, um, oh, yes, and this is one of a series. I've done quite a number of these Greek myth series. And uh, I think this one is um, the eternal play between men and women, as satyrs, the men in amorous pursuit of these nymphs, the women, and the women standing by, kind of uh, maybe tempting the men, maybe just uh, standing by, ready to be courted. And of course, they've offered up, these satyrs have off offered up the usual wine and, and uh, goodies there. <laughs> so <laughs> so, so that, that, was, that was just such a fun painting. To do and I and I also I put these satyrs kind of on the edge so they sort of surround if you notice they kind of surround these these uh, naked women here so they can't kind of are trapped <laughs> between the the uh, the the bad guys in fact the one up up above looks kind of like a devil although I didn't mean him to to be so sinister 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 and that's about it on that one also done in acrylic, by the way. And uh, this one is Disorder. This is called, this is another acrylic, very much acrylic here. And uh, with the flat, flat tones, I think, which acrylic does so nicely. And uh, yes, the guy with the white gloves here, I guess he's kind of the, uh, uh, the one in charge of the show, the master of ceremonies. And uh, the, the fellow on the left here on the, on the, on the uh, fence is kind of teetering, tottering on the edge. Maybe he'll fall in, maybe he won't. So it's kind of a, um, a trouble in the world that he's about to fall into, uh, jump into the fray. And once you jump in, there's kind of no way out. And, and this again was a kind of troubled feeling about our, our country and our world right now. And I don't want to hit you over the head with it, but it just gives some of the feeling that I have a dis, disconcerting feel of things not, not as they should be. Everything slightly out of place and threatening, including the poor little baby up there. And also that little green thing with the tongue sticking out. My kids <laughs> had this as a toy. And uh, I always they always were fascinated. The toy was always getting lost. Where's the toy? I can't remember the name of it. Maybe you remember this little green plastic thing. But I, I kind of got him in there with his tongue hanging out. So uh, that... That uh, about tells it, I think, on that one. Unless you have any questions about it. Uh, thanks, Barbara. So yeah. the reception when you saw Claire's painting, especially the the wolf, uh, you were quite taken with that. Yes. Yes. Do you want to yes. speak about that a little bit? I mean, you seem to like feel an affinity with the. Uh, Claire's. I think I, I felt quite an affinity with Claire's Claire's work. In fact, as I talked to her about, I actually mm -hmm. had a similar subject matter, not necessarily in this in this show, mm -hmm. but uh, her bird, her bird uh, birds in the woman's mm -hmm. hair uh, reminded me of, of some pastel drawings that I, in fact, mm -hmm. when I went home, I opened my my uh, file cabinet and 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 looked for those bird uh paintings mm -hmm. but uh yeah and and there were oh there's another one that that uh oh. i liked a lot which which was the puppet mm -hmm. uh that yes there's the birds in her hair i just think that is so such a delight Jeez, wonderful paintings uh, and the one next to it it reminded me of uh something i'd seen in a renaissance uh painting recently but i couldn't really recall i think we talked about that claire maybe mm -hmm. she yeah, we did. Yeah. Yeah. yeah right but i i can't remember and then 
Yes, there was, oh, there was, there was the puppet on a string. Mm -hmm. And yes, and that one, I, I just, I happen to have also done a broken, mine is not a puppet, but a little piece of molded uh, clay, which I then broke like mm -hmm. this is broken. So mine just sits by itself and it's called broken man against mm -hmm. a landscape. But I was amused to see that Claire had a, <laughs> a similar, uh, you know, idea going sure. on here. So, sure. so beautifully done. And, and with those heads in the background. Yeah. But I just particularly like the wolves because I thought that the two wolf paintings, they kind of talk to one another. You know, mm -hmm. you looked at one and then you got hold of the other one going up the stairs, those kids, mm -hmm. and what was going to go on up there, you didn't know. Yeah. So, so, yes. Yeah. So, and the photographs are, are just fit right in, I think, with this kind of mysterious goings on up there in the attic, you know, with the <laughs> women with their tattoos and and uh, maybe dancing and just having a gay old time up there, I guess I'd say. So, so, so those were, those were it, it was an enchanting, it is an enchanting show, I think. Would everybody agree with that? Yeah, I certainly would, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, thanks, Barbara. Yeah, yeah. thank wonderful. you. Thank yeah, you. Wonderful, wonderful. So Ari, I have a question for you, or maybe you could talk a little bit about your process here, because, and you know, they're pinhole photographs, but you're taking like multiple small pinhole and then you scan them and then bring them into Photoshop, correct? That's, yeah, that, that's, that's correct. And then, you know, and then sweat over them for hours, days, months, years. Yeah. Uh, uh, and making, you know, huge, huge files in Photoshop that have, you know, tons and tons of, of layers and also uh, proof printing them at the same time and making, you know, uh, iterations of an image that might, you know, be like 20, 25 iterations of one image until it just feels like, yeah, it's the composition feels feels right. And I'm not a big fan of the word intuitive because I think it's abused a lot, but um, these definitely, that's definitely how I, how I did them. I didn't have any, any real specific um, narrative in mind when I started them. Um, it was really trying to do what the figures wanted to have happen and what kind of results arose out of the sessions working with the various models. And the, what I would, you know, what they call in photography, the hit rate, that is the number of images that are keepers or ones that you might consider showing. Um, the hit rate percentage was pretty low uh, in these studio shoots. So I might, I might burn through, you know, 20 um, shots of instant film uh, over maybe two hours, maybe two and a half hours. And then if I was lucky, I would get maybe two or three that I would consider good and usable. So very, very slow, very, very slow process. So how do you keep your like morale up when it's such a, like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because I, I guess. It's a, no, I, no it's a, that's a fair, that's definitely a fair, a fair question. Um, I mean, I think I think the thing that kept the morale up was just um, uh, it was something that I think I, I had said yesterday in the workshop was that it's it's the learning process that is and you know and just kind of this the sort of serendipitous things that would happen the unpredictable things that would happen in the photography both because of the technical issues in the photography and also the specific models um, sometimes it would just be a, a really great uh, you know, call it a chemistry for, you know, for what, for lack of a better term, um, working in the studio. Um, and there would often be a lot of laughter because, you know, they're, sta they're, they, they're standing around sometimes completely nude uh, with this, you know, light that I have to kind of crawl around the floor with uh, to move around and not, not kill myself. 
Um, so sometimes the chemistry and the work, just kind of the working environment in the studio would, um, would just give rise to, to uh, imagery that would work. And then I would, I would take those and scan them and see where I could incorporate them into the series. Um, but it was pretty, it was pretty slow, slow going, but I think the intrigue of it and just getting maybe, you know, two or three of them close to completion kind of spurred me on to keep on going and see how far I could take it. Um, or at least how much I could take <laughs> before I, before I threw in the towel. And about nine images, I think, was about was about my limit. Thank you. Thank you. So, artists, do you have any questions for each other at this point? I, I do. I'd like to know, who, um, especially uh, Barbara, uh, who 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 are you usually looking at, or do, are there any artists that you find that you're that you come back to? and look at, you know, over and over again, that, you know, uh, that can, you know, maybe continue to fascinate you, uh, even, you know, even over a, a longer span of time. I know I have, I have them, uh, as people that I, that I go back and, and look at, uh, you know, people like Degas, uh, Max Beckmann, for instance, I do look at contemporary art. So I was just curious, um, who you might've been looking at uh, or maybe thinking about um, in terms of in terms of the the figurative compositions because I detected I detected maybe a little bit of of maybe some echoes of people that maybe I knew from Italian Renaissance art but I wasn't sure if that was necessarily something you were you were looking at. Yeah. Well, can you hear me? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, well, you know how it goes. At certain periods of your artistic life, you you you're interested in this artist, and then you move on, and somebody else. I used to be very interested in Baltus. Okay. And, and uh, then when people started telling me my work looked like Baltus, I wanted to get away from that. And and but uh, I've spent a lot of time in Italy, and looking at. Italian Renaissance paintings, and I mostly would say that 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 is my great interest. The yeah. um, the the color that I find mm -hmm. there, you know, the 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 exactness of some of the images. Uh, each each image seems to to have its its um, uh, its own identity. It is, you know, much as I love Degas and all of the the Impressionist paintings. I think my work more relates to to these uh, Renaissance uh, um, who who were narrative painters. I think, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. rather than you know landscape or 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 that kind of thing. So um, so and Picasso. I, I must say, I have to just say that whenever I get stuck for ideas, I say to myself, "Let's go look and see what Picasso." I have several Picasso books, and he's done just about everything. In every period of time, whatever he's done is 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 always inventive, and uh, I, I find great inspiration there. Which you might I, you don't see it in my work, but but I I do find him fascinating in that way for ideas, mm -hmm. oh, some in very particular. You know, uh, he's done some classical paintings of classical uh, uh, figures that he's brought into up sure. to date. Yeah. yeah, and uh, yeah, so so that kind of thing. Okay. That's 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 about all I have to say about it. And I, well, let me just add this: I I like to to put people in all of my paintings, and as many as I can. Uh, I I grew up in in uh, South Philadelphia, where we you couldn't get away from people. <laughs> you know, you were <laughs> you were just with them all the time, uh, on the street, in the house, at our family dinners. And, and I, I just think that this probably had a, a, a big effect on, on my interest in, in uh, putting people in the painting. So, yeah. Great. That's, that's, that's what I have to say. <laughs> so Claire, um, in June, you will be yep. teaching a four week um, art of bookmaking. Mm -hmm. 
Would yeah. you, could you speak a little bit about that? Oh, sure. You know, I taught folk arts for years. I retired um, in 20, yeah, 20, about five years ago, just before COVID. <laughs> um, and I, uh, but I taught uh, book arts at Drexel for 30 years. Um, I used book arts in my class at Tyler, but it wasn't specifically book arts that I taught there. Um, and it's just an exploration using the book as a primary, um, a primary medium, like, like a painting or a drawing or, a, you know, or a poem. I mean, I try to include um, people interested in writing as well. So the approach will be to show different formats. I've developed um, the course around formats that can be done what I th think of as tabletop binding. So you don't have to own a bindery to do them. Um, most of them are non-adhesive, which also makes it easier for anybody can enter the class without, you know, prerequisite in terms of materials. And hopefully everybody will have at least four book formats at the end of the class, um, one or more of which they can develop into a book statement. And I'm going to be talking a lot and showing um, images of how artists use this medium in roughly the categories of um, building a narrative, um, using the book as a non-narrative, using um, the book as a visual diary, uh, the book as an object, um, or text as image. And I have, you know, referenced materials for that. So, um, I've accumulated enough examples to uh, hopefully will inspire people to, you know, to de delve into the medium with some enthusiasm and creativity and, and fun, you know, just to have some fun with it. So, um, yeah, that'll be the, uh, in June. So looking forward to it. I haven't, I haven't taught for a while, but it'll be nice to do it again. I think it's nice to have a break and then come back to it. So, so that'll be nice. Yeah. Sounds great. Thank you, Claire. Yeah. Yeah. Can I put in a question there to Claire? Sure. Yes. Yeah, Claire, I, I just wondered if you read a lot of nursery rhymes growing up, as I did. I do. I did. And I memorized a lot of them. Yes. Yes. Um, and I had a lot of fairy tale books, but also, um, yeah, just the, sort of the classic uh, children's literature of, mm -hmm. of my era. <laughs> Hans Christian Andersen, yeah. uh, the Grimm brothers. Um, and and my, my mother, was, except for comic books, my mother was a real snob. She didn't like us reading comic oh, books. She, yeah. she didn't consider them, they weren't real books to her. So, um, so when I would go to my friend's house and have comic book orgies and then yeah. read, you know, they had tons of them and I'd read them. But the funny thing is I got bored of them and then I went back to my regular storybooks, you yeah. know, with yeah. text. But um. But yes, nursery rhymes were fun. Um, I enjoyed the sound, um, but the, the stories themselves. And and I've always, I've used the book form and my paintings always yeah. to present. Well, I mentioned there. I mentioned Grimm's fairy tales because oh, yeah. yeah, that was that was something that I see. I don't yeah. want to say I see it in your work, but oh but yeah, I just, I definitely. Wonder, they, yeah, and I they, I've read those too. So sure, sure, yeah. yeah. Also, I wanted to, you're, you're mentioning books, and I, too, do uh, books, so I, I've probably, really? yeah, I've done a dozen I, or more single copy books with yeah, um, yeah. graphic novel type things, or smaller, or just that sure, kind of thing. Sure, sure. Yeah, so that, that also fit into my background of, of books. My, my father worked in a bookstore, so I kind of spent yeah. my whole childhood in, a, in that <laughs> same bookstore. Yeah. Well, on that note, I guess we yeah. will end here. Thank you so much, Wonderful. Claire, Barbara, Michael. and I for, for Thanks, Michael, for doing this. Yeah. Thank you so much for getting us in on this. <laughs> yes, thank you, Michael. <laughs> I'm glad it I'm glad it worked out. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much. Goodbye. Right. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye. The, the, before, just bye before bye. you leave, I just mm -hmm. want to mention that the show is up through March twenty fourth. And we hope everyone can come down and see it. And everything is also available on the website, cerulearnarts.com, as well as 
registration for for Claire's workshop. Okay. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very good. That so, may be something I could do. Time. All right. Right. Well, thank thanks you. again. Thank and you. Have a great night. Right. You too. Now. Thank bye you. bye. Now. Bye bye. Bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye everyone.